Podcasts Radio Network proudly presents The Broadcasters Podcast, where we dive deep into the media industry headlines and dissect the digital disruption that diverges the masses into the new media counterculture and away from the media establishment. Here is the king of podcasts. My initial message to Warner Brothers Discovery, <clears throat> you know what? I would have gone to the theaters to go watch Batgirl. I would have gone to see Leslie Grace play Batgirl, along with the fact that Michael Keaton was going to pr- reprise the role of Batman <clears throat> and uh, Brendan Fraser was going to play a villain. Like, I was all in for that. I would have preferred it didn't go to HBO Max. I would have preferred it went to the theaters. And I actually really think it wouldn't have gone the route of Morbius. You know, maybe $100 million they spent on the on the film, but <clears throat> I have to feel like maybe they were going to get that back. Like you can make the money back on there. But David Zasloff, the new CEO of the combined Warner Brothers Discovery, which I said there would be a lot of things that happened with this episode, where, where things were going to happen with this group and what was going to go on as a result of all this. And... I always said, you know what, be careful what happens here because a lot of things could change. And I knew it was going to be like that. It was like, what could be the outcome of all this? Back in May of 2021, we had talked about the initial merging of Warner Media to Discovery, which would include podcasting networks. And Discovery CEO Jason David Zaslav would be the CEO, and Jason Kalar stepped away. Because of the conglomeration. As we know with media mergers, there are many casualties among something like this. Many casualties in a in, in an entity like this. And the content has been the focus now this week. And that has really irked some people. Specifically the DCEU. The DC Universe. But a lot has been said today about what happened here. Because since we heard the news of the shelving of Batgirl, we have gotten to the point of these earnings call between Warner Brothers Discovery to learn what has happened to them, which made them go into what they're going to do now with the changes they're making, which has really made a lot of people on TikTok, a lot of social media really go viral on the story. We're going to talk about all that. We're going to unpack it all as much as we can in a particular order. Run through a quick timeline to make sure that you're all caught up because I'm sure you might have seen all the story here in bits and pieces. We're going to try to put it all together tonight here on the Broadcasters Podcast. Thanks for listening in, subscribing, making sure if you listen to it on YouTube, I hope you make comments in there. Other things like that, thank you for listening in. Let's get into it. First things first, we go back to August 2nd. So it's Tuesday. And we learned that the Batgirl film has been axed by Warner Brothers and will not be released on any platform. The original plan was HBO Max. Now, we know of the issues we talked about back in 2020 when Wonder Woman came out. And the idea that they were going to simultaneously push out on Christmas Day in theaters and on HBO Max. And I hated it. Suicide Suicide Squad, the second one, I hated it too. (coughs) And DC already had some movies all set up, and then things just kind of switched around. The Flash getting pushed around. Then you're seeing Shazam and Aquaman and Black Adam kind of being shuffled around, too. There was a lot of stuff going on that that was not necessarily feeling good here about what they were doing. And that's what was one of the other things that was being really considerate. Because of the moves at Warner Brothers, which does create good content, and specifically HBO Max, which they had under their umbrella, and what is being done with it, Discovery now making decisions is getting people confused. So we need to go through that, what was even said in the earnings call. Let's run through it all. First of all, Batgirl being axed. The story initially was, it will not premiere on any platform at the studio. It's starring Leslie Grease as Barbara Gordon, a.k.a. Batgirl. Directed by Bad Boys for Life and Ms. Marvel filmmakers Adil El Arbi and Bilal Fala, was greenlit in 2021 as a company wide effort to create feature films for HBO Max. But now this changes things. The Warner Brothers Discovery now wants to pivot, to be pivot to making theatrical features. The DC movies need to be big box office movies. And what David Zaslav said on the earnings call was he wants movies back. As epic as with a 10 year plan, he says, much like 
what was done with Kevin Feige being brought to the helm for Marvel Studios on behalf of Disney. This is the same idea he wants to do here. And I think it's just because of the fact that we didn't want to go and see the changes happen. And then all of a sudden, we're not even going to get a chance to go ahead and watch some of the products that are already done without just maybe rebooting things. I don't know. And we can all remember there was a time where in DC or Marvel universes, they didn't have everything all down pat and ready to go. And they might have had a couple of flubs in between. I mean, that's for Marvel. Remember how many years Marvel struggled in the 70s and 80s to try to put projects together besides the animation that really stood out and did good. Because remember, when you look at the, you know, the Nicholas Hammond Spider-Mans, or you look at what they try to do in Japan and all these other things, it was kind of hokey. With DC, it was a bit different because Superman was just, you know, fantastic. But even DC also had its own issues with Green Lantern and things like that. Listen, they've notoriously been bad. And so you're just going to go and cut out anything that is trying to go towards the right direction. Look, I mean, I know everybody got upset with Zack Snyder when they were at that, they realized there was a cut of the Justice League that was done better and that people had a little more faith behind it. And so there have been decisions that haven't been perfect, but that shouldn't mean you just scrap everything and start over. Because the biggest thing happens now is that what are you going to do now? Are you going to recast everybody? Are you just going to change everything up and create a new universe off of what's the original storylines? What are you going to do here? What you're doing is already going to be recreating particular characters. Look, you don't want to have Henry Cavill back as Super- Spider-Man, as uh, Superman. You don't want to have Ben Affleck back as Batman. Okay, you don't want to have um, whatever. We know there's a number of stars that they have within that have still stood the test pretty well. Aquaman, Jason Momoa, you got them locked. When you talk about Wonder Woman and Gal Gadot, you got her locked. Superman did have the look in Henry Cavill, and he was about as good as you can get next to Christopher Reeve. Brandon Routh didn't have it, right? You could have had Tom Welling, but by the time now to put him in there, I guess not. And so you have a number of things that were successful in the DC Universe, but then you bring this here and you're saying you just want to go and give up on it. I don't. I guess maybe the corporate types, like the David Zaslavs of the world, don't realize how much that's going to hurt this universe, because they're all hoping for DC to come out better, so they can then push Marvel, and collectively both of them as competition will push each other to make better content, to be out there for digging for these universal, these cinematic universe pictures in DC or Marvel, what they are and bringing them up to life. And yeah, not putting them out on streaming first makes sense. And that was a mistake that was made by Jason Kalar in the pandemic, but everybody panicked. What are you going to do right there? The whole simultaneous streaming, I thought was a bad idea. People that got HBO max as a result of the HBO max being launched, that might've helped, but this didn't help. The other part too, is the HBO max product and where it is going to be now going forward. But we now have an announcement about that. We can finally talk about it. But anyway, back to the story with axing Batgirl. Scoob Holiday Haunt, a prequel to the 2020 film Scoob, also getting shelled. And production already cost $40 million for that movie. And this is the other thing that's uh, the contention. Studio insiders insist the decision to ask Batgirl was not driven by the quality of the film or the commitment of the filmmakers. The desire of the studio slate of DC features at, to be out at a blockbuster scale. Initial $75 million production budget for the project, finishing principal photography earlier this year, and post-production reached $90 million. That's also because of COVID-related delays of protocols. All this time. And... Michael Keaton's always going to get another payday. He was always going to find another role somewhere else. Brendan, Brendan Fraser is going to find work also in another place pretty soon. But I mean, I feel bad for Leslie Grace. What a young, multi-talented, beautiful, uh, enthusiastic, and just, I mean, really, I feel like she was not going to be what Halle Berry was, the Catwoman. I don't think that was going to happen. This is a secondary character. 
All right. I don't think anybody should have really worried about the fact that, okay, if we're not going to get this here, then this. It's a secondary character, nevertheless. This is not one of the main characters in the DC universe. It's one that's important because of what was being done here in terms of representation. A young Latina playing the role of Batgirl, which I think she would have done really well. She's really talented. She was in the Heights in that musical, which, look, it wasn't her performance that brought the show down. She was good from all accounts, but the movie wasn't good. And trying to compare West Side Story and trying to do that, no, can't do it. So, In the Heights might not have done what it did, but I don't think you can blame Leslie Grace for that. I would have been all in to watch this movie. I mean, look at her in the outfit. Like when I, I mean, everybody showed the teaser of that outfit. And by the way, when they want to go ahead and position that story, everybody to get clickbait, they have Leslie Grace looking gorgeous in that Batgirl outfit. And I mean. You would have just had the awe of men all over the place simping over Leslie Grace to watch this movie. And what was wrong with that? Well, they should have just gone with it. That's all I'm saying about that. Brenda Fraser is going to play the villain Firefly. You also had J.K. Simmons playing Barbara's father, Commissioner Jim Gordon. I mean, they had the cast. This movie was going to be really interesting. And no matter what, it would have been a cult classic. Because of no matter what. I mean, Catwoman got panned, but then eventually they all like that. And then in the movie, they talk about the fact that there's crazy stunts, crazy drops. She's a biker chick, so you're going to see her do a bunch of badassery. There were a lot of long days, but it was so worth it. Oh, I feel bad for her. And I hope that Hollywood will realize, you know what? This girl got a, got a tough break. And that hopefully she's going to get noticed to do another role, something else. Like, I'll tell you what, take all those skills and all that training that she did to be in this role. Let's give her another action film. By all means, can we give Leslie Grace another move? Can we get green light another movie for her to be in and let her do this? And let's just do something. If it's not a DC character, let's just give, let's just put her in a good movie somewhere. Like, there's a lot of places to go to put her in. You know what movie I would think about? And I'm, I'm, I was just thinking about this earlier. There was a movie that Gina Rodriguez, who played Jane the Virgin, there was a movie that was done back in 2019 called Miss Bala. Anybody remember that movie? It was where a young girl saw help from the police when the cartel hitman kidnapped her friend from a nightclub in Mexico, and she found herself in big trouble when a corrupt cop hands her over to the same goons who shot up the place. Leslie Gray should have had that role. February 2019, you could have put her there because I think, because the movie didn't do that well. Give me Leslie Grace in that role. I think it would have been better. And I remember that movie. Just just a thought. I think there's a lot of movies she could have been put in yet. I mean, especially just coming off of In the Heights, there's something more that you can look at. And by the way, I'm not even talking about her movie career so much about Leslie Grace because of the fact that I remember her from her music. You know, she's won three Latin Grammy Awards. Three. So, I mean, her part is a music is, as a musician, as a singer, and she's very good. But then you go off and you say, okay, then what's going on here? And I'll tell you the other thing, too, that was really important is that it took a while to see what was going to happen about this. But I must say that Leslie Grace handled it really well. By the way, she's both, both born to the Dominican parents, and she just handled it so well. Good for her. I really appreciate where she's come through what she's done for herself. So to handle the way this movie handled, that just makes her a darling in Hollywood. So let's give her something better. I'm pulling for that. And actually, I would love to be one of those people that would also encourage people out there in the DCEU. They need to release this movie. Write to David Zasloff. By all means, tell him you want to see Leslie Grace in that Batgirl movie. I want to see it. Like if there's a petition out there, I'll sign it. Somebody send it to me, please. You want to put it in the YouTube channel, put it in the comments, or just go to the contact form at broadcasterspodcast.com. Please send me if there's anything like that out there. I'd love to sign it. I'd love to support it. Just saying. Let's move along into the story.
the reasons behind what's going on here is the business side. And that's the part that we need to really pay attention to more than anything as to why everything's going on like it did. Because HBO Max is a, a major role in this because of the fact that they were not going to put into HBO Max. And they also chose not to move it to theaters. So just to shelve it, the initial plan of HBO Max, why not put it on HBO Max? Because if David Zaslav is talking about doing theatrical releases that way, then why are we doing that? Why why is that the decision? I want to find that out. And so what we're learning now, which is always the result of everything goes on with media, Batgirl is now a casualty of the merger. Because not only did Warner Brothers Discovery merge in 2021, well, now the decision has been made for the streaming services, they're going to be combined, merged into a single streaming platform next summer. This time next summer, we're going to see a combined HBO Max and Discovery Plus. Now, one of the things I think is getting everybody confused is because everybody thinks that the decisions being made on how Discovery Plus and HBO Max are going to be used are they're getting misconstrued because people think, oh, well, Discovery Plus is only going to be female-centric or female-skewed, and HBO Max is male-skewed, as if there's not going to be any kind of mixing at all. What they're trying to say is that there'll be more content on HBO Max that will be much more targeted towards a male demographic, but it does not mean all the shows are going to be that way. Discovery Plus is because, and everybody wants to not realize how big of a behemoth Discovery Plus is, or Discovery in general, because Discovery Networks and all of the own, it's some of the biggest channels out there that make a lot of money, just to know. Among the channels they have, Discovery Channel, TLC, Animal Planet, Investigation Discovery, and Discovery Channel. I mean, well, it's being uh, Discovery Kids. And there's more. Science Channel they own. They also own, well, and remember, they also own Food Network. The OWN, Oprah Winfrey Network. Then you got Motor Trend. You got HDTV, the Magnolia Channel, which is the uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines. They just created their own damn network, right? Travel Channel, American Heroes Channel, Cooking Channel. There's a lot right there. Those are a lot of channels that are targeted towards women. You're talking about home, you know, home improvement, cooking. You're talking about reality shows. You're talking about, you know, nature shows, things like that. There's quite a bit of programming there that is really targeted towards a female audience. You might not think so. Plus, you also have to think about what are the age groups as well. When you look at what HBO Max might be doing is, you know, House of the Dragon or Succession, are those necessarily female-driven shows? For every House of, Dra- House of the Dragon or Succession, there's a flight attendant or euphoria, right? Things like that. For how about Peacemaker? Is that necessarily a female-driven demographic show? No, but some of those shows are going to continue to go on. But the, the plan was already in place to start removing more of the scripted programming. Because Discovery never does scripted programming. It, it, it might do reality shows that might be scripted, but still, they're not doing that like they normally do because of the fact that it's not their show. That's not their, that's not their back. They really excel on producing reality-based, pretty inexpensive programming. Because the reality programming, that's why 20 years ago it became such a popular thing because it didn't cost that much to produce. And you could... Produce in bulk, and you could put it together, and you're making stars out of nobodies in many cases, and it works. Especially when you see all those shows like Property Brothers or, you know, Flip or Flop or things like that. I mean, there are so many shows that have made so much money. Fixer Upper, that was the big show that Chip and Joanna Keynes made, and which is what was the onus to create Magnolia Network. Because that show used to be one of the top 10 cable shows across the board. If you look right now, there's still quite a bit of shows they do. Shark Week, they put a whole lot of money into that Discovery does all the time because people watch it. And that's been going for 25 years. And all these other channels that they have are such a big deal because they have so much going on. HGTV, think about it. I mean, you can't get past the doctor's office without having that channel on or dentist's office for that matter. 
there's all of that they're doing. It gets a lot. So there's a lot of channels they run and a lot of content that's used for streaming across the board. We're talking about all the programming that they have that they have on Discovery Plus, and they're one of the larger charging uh, channels. I think they're nine ninety five a month for all their programming, and people are buying it. If you look at their subscribers, combined they have ninety two million subscribers total, and Discovery Plus actually started later. So, say about seventy five million or so are going towards HBO Max. Let's just give that as a guesstimate. But the truth is, you're still talking about there's a lot of money right there. There's a lot of audience just on those plat- platforms. And that's not even a full gamut of full programming like an HBO Max does, or a Peacock, or Amazon Prime, or a Netflix. With the expansive program that they had, those kind of things. So they explained that HBO Max may or may, may not be the part of the name of the unified direct to consumer WBD platform. And that's research is being done on consumer perception of the HBO Max name. HBO continue, will continue to be a major brand, but it's always going to be the beacon and the ultimate brand that stands for television quality, which is the other part they have to worry about is that HBO Max, if they're going to start combining everything, maybe they're not going to keep the HBO name as part of the streaming service because it is synonymous. Home box office is, is synonymous with quality pay TV programming. So to water it down for other shows that come on board, like HBO Max, there is a certain level of something. I mean, HBO, when you think of HBO programming, original programming, when you look at what real sports is or when they did inside the NFL, or you look at all the shows they have from the wire, Sopranos, the deuce vinyl, I, and these are all the shows I enjoy, by the way. Six Feet Under, True Blood. I mean, there's a lot of shows you think about. And then the current li- the stuff right now, Big Little Lies, Succession, Euphoria, synonymous with some major programming, okay? Keep that in mind. Now let's look into the rest of this. So after the summer 2023 rollout of the newly merged HBO max discovery unnamed combined streaming platform, they'll move it into Latin America in the fall of that year. And then next year, 2024, they'll have it in Europe and then Asia Pacific and other markets. They'll be worldwide. So right now they're saying in the second quarter, as the, according to the earnings call they had today, a combined 92.1 million up 22%. And that by 2025, Warner Brothers Discovery expects to have over 130 million global streaming subscribers. And then the real interest is, there's a number of things that you have to take into interest about what's going to be kept and what's going to go away. And what they decide to do. Because I'm not sure what they're going to do. The merged HBO Max Discovery Plus will smash together thousands of hours. And one of the things they did is the Magnolia Network programming was going to HBO Max this September while remaining on Discovery Plus. All they're doing is just mirroring the same thing. But it's going to take a year for all these changes to be made. But in the meantime, they started making some changes. So we got to talk about that. So a lot of people talk about David Zasloff in a negative light throughout all of this. And Hollywood has been commenting. The rap.com talks about it. Creators are furious at the upheaval. This is just about a few movies. So let's talk about who in Hollywood is talking vocally about this. Let's first take a quote from C. Robert Cargo, who helped write Dr. Strange and the Black Phone. And he says, quote, the reason... Hollywood is so shook by the HBO Max stories is that there no one is sure whether this is an isolated incident or a canary in the coal mine. This isn't just about a few movies. Another writer and producer of Roswell, New Mexico and the originals, Karina Adley McKenzie added, quote, we're out here worrying about the HBO Max shows we already love, but so many people are about to get their years of hard development work thrown out and we'll never even know 70% of script development is so, so, so many people's life's work. This is put into a tweet she does. And she says that the bizarre decision of HBO Max, quote, between the CW bloodbath, this bizarre decision of HBO Max 
she puts in caps, their content was leg- legit good and Batgirl getting tossed in the bin. I don't know. Can anyone confirm WB isn't being run by three kids in a trench coat? So sad for all these creators who trusted their studio. And this is what goes for me where I always talk about the content creators. I'm standing for you guys and pointing out the corporate mess that goes on on a regular basis. The corporate establishment, when they get involved in things like this, look at what happens all the time. Also, Dickinson, uh, creator, the Apple TV series Dickinson, Alina Smith shared that she requested a physical copy of her series. She says, quote, the Batgirl HBO Max situation is, was why I spent my last day on set of Dickinson calling an exec at Apple and begging for a physical recording of my show. They actually gave me one. I have the only copy, but, but people said I was crazy. But, dude, that's 10 years of my life. Adam Conover, who has the show Adam Ruins Everything, took on the dismantling of the streaming service and saying, quote, HBO Max is widely acknowledged to be the best streaming service. And now the execs who, are, who brought it are on the verge of dismantling simply because they feel like it. Mergers just give a few wealthy people massive control over what we watch with disastrous results. I, I get where they're coming from right there. But it's the scripted shows that are taking away. Well, you're not going to expect every streaming service to do the same thing. Let's just be honest. And it's no surprise that a corporate entity like this decides to do that. Because you know what they're going to do? They're going to force the other streaming services to take on the content because the other problem is that how much money are they going to spend on new content for the streaming services? That's what they're not going to do. So Zazzle doesn't want to do that. In terms of the company, he's trying to say that it's not the streaming that's going to be where they need to put all their effort into. He wants to resurrect movies. He wants to have all different pipelines of revenue available, which is what he's trying to do with the cost cutting as well. I get what he's trying to do, but yeah, there's going to be casualties, creative casualties, as a matter of fact, and that's what sucks about all this. The reaction to Zaza's HBO Max decisions from the creative community could end up mirroring the reaction with Jason Kalar, who was running Warner Media, to release all of Warner Brothers' 2021 films in theaters and day and date on HBO Max, which was a mistake. I get it. They, They had to put the movies out. But this was one of those things that really did piss people off. And the announcement anger filmmakers like Christopher Nolan and Denis Villeneuve, who value an exclusive theatrical window, while more Warner Media subs- subsequently doled out, make good payments to talent to make up for any perceived box office losses by the streaming debuts. Remember Black Widow? Well, that was that was not that Black Widow was kind of an example of you know the streaming that was being done. And the money that was not being doled out for the artists for doing that. And so some people feel like that, you know, David Zaslav, he's been with Discovery this whole time. And he's not in touch with what HBO Max is and what it stands for, for everybody out there. Which I can understand that part. But the part that we all know was going to happen pretty soon is the fact that we're going to probably start seeing layoffs. Just like Disney did with Fox. Same thing will happen again. So HBO Max... And Discovery Plus combining forces, we're going to see some duplicity, some redundancy that's going to get dropped. So there's that part being talked about as well. And unfortunately, the rap decided to put a big paywall on it, so I can't read it there. (laughs) That's okay. And then it was a story from Deadline that talked about the what's behind the Batgirl Scoop discard where they actually did an opinion on it to try to give some context to what was going on here. The makers of Batgirl and Scoob learned, learned, and this is reporting this on Tuesday, that they learned through social media and through other reports that the films were being stopped in their tracks. The Batgirl co-directors were in Morocco for Adil L. Arby's wedding. And they expected to return to the cutting room and continue work on the film. And now they don't get to. It was in post-production. There were initial cries that the scrapping of the Batgirl carried bad optics because of the title roles played by a Latina. Well, I'm not going to go with that whole part of representation. I don't think the fact that she's Latina makes any much of a difference. She's a talented actress. And 
It's just like if you had Anna de Armas doing a role like they had on the, the Bond movie. Are we going to worry about her being Cuban? No. It doesn't make a difference. I mean, as, and listen, whatever you think of me when I say this, because I find beauty in a lot of women, but for me, when it comes to Leslie Grace, listen, she's a screen siren, okay? And I think she's talented enough to have done a movie like this because she is. She's a singer, songwriter, actress. She's multi-talented. I would have loved to see how she had done with this role. And she obviously put the time and the effort into it. So the filmmakers were told it came down to a purchase accounting maneuver available to Warner Brothers Discovery. It's a corporate, hey, it's a way to kind of like, you know, make a shortcut to, to cut some losses, right? From some other things that were failing. Keep that in mind. Nothing even happened with these movies yet. But here's the explanation now. The opportunity expires in mid-August. And that Warner Brothers Discovery to not have to carry the losses on the books at a time when the studio is trying to pare down $3 billion in debt across its divisions because the amount of content was being spent on. And the speculation of how Batgirl was canceled having to do with it being a bad movie, sources said the film tested once and the result wasn't that bad considering the cut had been temporary visual effects to tend to temper audience enthusiasm in the scores. And the studio was already discussing making different deals with the directors and Grace because it was not a reflection on their talent as much as the radical radical strategy shift. And then you put these directors together on to do this movie, $60 to $70 million budget, 60 to $70 million budget. And they were behind the movies Black and the Disney Plus series Ms. Marvel under Kevin Feige, as well as the Bad Boys for Life movie, which made $426 million before the pandemic hit. They were doing the right thing. They had the right people on board to go and do this movie. So David Zaslav was rejecting Kilar's strategy to lean heavily into building streaming subscriptions for HBO Max, which is what everybody else was doing. Nobody was paying attention to the movie. So this is the part where I agree with the part that, yes, the movies need to be more important. And for whatever reason, they stopped doing that. Now, the Project Popcorn Initiative which is what was Jason Kalar's plan to do day and date for the movies. The entire theatrical slate, which was including Dune, Godzilla vs. Kong, King Richard, The Matrix 4, among other movies, all got pushed to streaming. Wonder Woman 1984, Suicide Squad 2, they all got pushed to streaming. Oh, the, uh, the Soprano sequel. That was a mistake. There was a lot of money being left out there because everybody thought, well, the pandemic, people are not going back to the movies. Well, guess what? I went back to the movies. Except for Wonder Woman 1984. Most of the other movies I got to watch. I think it was around April or May I started going back to the theaters of 2021. And we got back in. And I was all in there for it. And now the movies are coming back. And it's just the superhero movies are doing well. The other thing, keep in mind as well. Okay. With the movies that were coming out. There's not a lot of competition in the movie theaters to get those movies out because superhero movies are going to draw a crowd. So no matter what, you put Batgirl out, you could have put Batgirl out whenever you wanted. I mean, if they're going to have to wait, you know, you could have put that out next year, early 2023. Theatrical release. See what happens with it. I mean, look at what they have in terms of what movies they have ready to go going forward. The movies that are coming up, if they were going to do it next year, you have The Flash, Blue Beetle, and Aquaman on The Lost Kingdom. You could have had room for one more movie. Batgirl could have been it if you wanted to. With all the movies that they had out there, it couldn't have hurt to put that movie somewhere into another quarter of the year and bring it out. You could have started out the year with Batgirl. And that would have been fine. You could have had it all done, released, and you probably would have made your money back. Plus, the Latin America market would have been all over because they would have seen this girl as Batgirl and they would have been all in. I don't know. They didn't think about it. And people did not agree with this initiative because look at what Top Gun did. Top Gun grossing worldwide $1.3 billion. Top Gun has been like just a stellar success. It shows you without a shadow of a doubt, people want to go see movies again. Now you just need the movies to come back out and make them good. So, 
I give credit to David Zaslav that he wants to do that. But again, this is all talk. The execution is going to be key. Now, the budgets were still not the much as what Flash and Aquaman are getting, or there were going to be designed right now as tentpole theatrical releases. So that's one thing that can be said. And in addition, there were introductions of characters in the film that the studio wanted to save for those DC theatrical titles. So there's some other things within the storyline they wanted to also keep so the DC Universe could do the release, and it's all in theaters, as opposed to having it part on HBO Max and not whatever. Like with the Marvel plan, there are side characters that are being pushed across the board. Ms. Marvel, Hawkeye, and all this other stuff. The Winter Soldier, that's all on Disney+. Plus as the plan, but then you have the major tent poles with Dr. Strange, you got the Marvel, you know, Black Panther, what kind of forever. And all those that are all featured theaters. Like I would like it to be like that. And I want the DC universe to also be the same way. So DC is going to be preserved as a place that takes big swings. They'll have Aquaman two, flash black Adam, uh, Shazam fury, of the gods. They're going to do a sequel in 2024 for Joker with Lady Gaga in the in in a female it's a female uh, protagonist. It's going to be along a sidekick basically to the Joker. I can't believe we're going to get that. Whew. Which the movie did extremely well. Like Joker was one of the best movies of what 2018, 2019. I forget. And another Wonder Woman pick, a third Wonder Woman pick, which I hope gets better. Now, they made this point in the statement for Warner Brothers Discovery to put a good light on things, even though the decisions that were being made did not settle well. Quote, the decision to not release Batgirl reflects our leadership strategic shift as it relates to the DC Universe and HBO Max. Leslie Grace is an incredibly talented actor, and this decision is not a reflection of her performance. We're incredibly grateful to the filmmakers of Batgirl and Scoob Holiday Haunt and their respective casts, and we hope to collaborate with everyone in the near future. I want them to just put, you know, just as a, as a saving grace, as a token to the fans, it's okay to restart. Look, Marvel's going to do that now. They're going to eventually go back to Iron Man. They're going to redo Spider-Man again. They're going to do whatever they want. They're going to go back and always go back to the well. They're going to bring back Fantastic Four. That's what they do. They always go back. Look, they've done Spider-Man with three different uh, characters, and they put them all in the same movie. So they're just pillaging away and just milking away on the intellectual property for as much as they can. Because that's what Disney wants. There's no shame in that game if DC wants to do that. So put your movies out that you have out there and just go with it. I mean, is there a way to recut the movie so that you're not losing out some of those other characters that are brought in? Can you do that part? Like, Let's do something here to do a recut. It's just in post-production. Let's just cut the movie up. Take some of the parts you want to have out. Let's just try to see if we can keep this story as a standalone. And then just move forward with the DC universe. Can we do that? I mean, you're only going to have to do something here with Aquaman and Shazam and all these other movies coming up and Black Adam that are all in, ready to be released. So what are you going to do? These are the kind of things I think about all the time. But, you know, I don't know what they're going to do. So we're going to leave that story there and we're going to just follow along and see what happens after all of this. But I got a few more stories to bring up before we wrap things up here on the broadcasters podcast, namely getting back into our talk on new music discovery, streaming platforms, music, radio. Let's talk all about that real quick. First of all, billboard in their pro section, put a story out about why streaming platforms are getting into distribution. They did a whole comprehensive story because TikTok and SoundCloud are in a crowded market against Spotify that where Spotify abandoned the crowded market of distribution. And so TikTok back in March launched Sound On and their global head of music, Oli Oberman, said the aim was ensuring that, quote, every aspiring musician in the world thinks, quote, I want to start my music career and the journey I'm going to do it through TikTok. Well, it's becoming very popular now. Now, music distribution is one of the industry's recent goal rushes, and streaming platforms are among the companies taking interest in the space. Spotify for Artists was done in September 2018, but they discontinued it the next July. SoundCloud started offering premium users distribution in 2019, and Tencent, 
expanded its Tencent Musician platform into an initiative dubbed One Click for All, allowing artists to distribute their music through more than 150 platforms. But the one thing that's being talked about is the amount of places to distribute your music is the one the issue is right here. So while Sound On is still in its infancy, they're curious about the ability of what it gives their acts a competitive advantage on TikTok because why is now being believed widely to be the crucial proving ground for any contemporary hits, which it is. Let's be honest, it's been like that for a while now. And veteran distributors professed indifference to digital streaming, nosing their business into as understandable given Spotify's brief entry and speedy exit. Now, SoundCloud presents a natural step for a platform that's long served as a springboard for young artists, particularly hip-hop acts. Look at the breakthrough. So when a streaming service with the reach and influence of SoundCloud or TikTok adds distribution or artist services on paper and has the potential to be the best record label in the world, which is what the record labels are afraid of because they lose their clout. They lose their in- their influence, the control that they have over artists, and the bad deals they get. We talked extensively on the program about how you have artists out there like FK Twigs and Halsey and others that have to wait for one of their songs to go viral on TikTok before they release a single or an album for that matter. What are they able to do without TikTok? I mean, how many artists and how many songs do we see now that hit the Billboard Hot 100 because of just TikTok alone? See, the thing is that it has to matter about what happens after that and what songs can be pushed higher up. Meanwhile, in every other country around the world, a song can chart and do very well. But in America, we have this antiquated system of corruption and control. You know what's funny? I was just getting started on a BBC decade, 80s decade documentary. And they explained how when MTV came into the space in the 1980s, that before all that, I mean, you still had the control of radio that you could still influence and manipulate and persuade radio to fall suit with what songs were popular because they were getting paid off. And this is where I almost feel like payola. I wish it was brought back in some way, shape or form. Not the way it is now. Not this corporate large sense where just only a couple of people are brought into the mix. No, I want a whole gamut of things being taken care of. Just saying. So sound Dawn's doing a lot of things with this. They're talking about now, that they're generating more upside, building out A&R and playlist pitching capabilities. And Oberman actually says, we're committed to expanding the offering and building on the expert team we have in place and the high levels of service we're already offering. Because here's the thing, too. Would Sound on even consider, you know, promoting radio? Because that's what they're doing right now. Artist repertoire. They're trying to get into the promotion business. So who's going to service? I mean, are they going to only service streaming? Or will they... Consider to go radio because the record labels couldn't afford to continue to go after and service radio. They let them go. Remember that. So now, would TikTok, with sound on, would they approach radio? And would they get them to get on the phones with the music directors, do the callbacks, and see if something happens here? Like, could we get that going on? Like, I would like Obi Oberman and his team with sound on. Let's do that. That would be a great move. Now, the artists would also get brand partnerships, the opportunities for that. Brands are using their songs and are striving success on TikTok as well as more traditional digital services, too. What they also haven't done yet, which is what Facebook was trying to do, which is what YouTube's been doing for a long time, is having music videos listed on TikTok. But I don't know if the platform, I mean, the platform can sustain it. But are people going to watch videos for that long on TikTok? I don't know what the retention is yet if that can be possible. And as a result of all this, we still have the issue going on with music and how things are changing right now with how radio is still manipulating into streaming. Spotify, for whatever reason, has changed their today's top hits gamut. If you've noticed, it's definitely much different than it was before because today's top hits was very much Anything that goes viral got pushed onto the chart into their list quickly. But Sean Ross at Ross on Radio and RadioInside.com puts a great point out, and he actually points this out. I'm glad he put it out there. He asks a great question off the bat. And I definitely think he was not wrong. 
Over the last few years, I've wondered if today's top hits, Spotify's showcase CHR playlist, would re- resonate with today's young adults the way that my generation remembers America Top 40. Well, everything I've seen so far suggests that radio has been usurped, but not replaced as a shared experience of the same magnitude. I wonder, would you have songs like Toto the T by Rule Alejandro enduring in today's top hits? It was nearly routinely to the top of today's top hits last year without getting past Latin formats at radio. So what you're seeing right now with today's top hits, the excitement of new music on a regular basis when top 40 has so few consensus hits and little music enterprise. Remember I talk about enterprise when it comes to music, allowing other songs to ferment and become top songs on the charts. And not letting Ryan Seacrest and Media Base be the bearers of what songs are allowed to be deemed top songs, top 10 hits or whatever. While, you know, flipping their nose at what Billboard does and their Hot 100. With the headlines about fewer recent hits and the increased dominance of older music and streaming, he sensed Ross here that TTH wasn't as aggressive on new music, relying more on hits that linger longer, as well as mid- more mid-chart songs that come drifting back on after the chart peak. So when you look at songs like he- Levitating and Heat Wave, making a second Sierra chart run at Currents. So when you look at Spotify up against radio, he looks at today's top hits right now, based on the July 20th rankings, and how the perspective on the hits overlaps or differs from radio. So here's what he has right now. You have the songs that are most popular songs right now on contemporary hit radio at the moment. Five songs right now. Today's top hits, number one song as, as we speak is Lizzo about that. Well, actually, I don't know if it's that right now. I think it's Beyonce right now, if I'm correct. I'd have to go look at their list real quick and see where they are. But I can tell you real quick, if I go on their list right now and I look at the Today's Top Hits listing, it's going to show me as it was Harry Styles is their first song on the list. Running up the hill, Kate Bush. Despecha, Rosalia is third. About them time. Fourth. Woman Republic's I Ain't Worried. Five. I Like You. Post Malone, Doja Cat. Six. Break My Soul. Seven. Quevedo. Biz Rap Music Sessions. Eight. Left and Right. Charlie Puth. BTS. Young Cook. Nine. Vegas. Doja Cat. Ten. Among others. Now, the growing songs on CHR. K. Bush running up that hill. How many more weeks are you going to wait to have that song be at the top? Of, I mean, it's, Stranger Things is already done. So what are you waiting for? Post Malone, Doja Cat, I Like You, Charlie Puth, Young Cook, uh, Cook, Left and Right, One Republic, Ain't Worried, Doja Cat, Vegas, Joji, Glimpse of Life, Glimpse of Us, Glimpse of Life. He says Glimpse of Life is Glimpse of Us. Beyonce, Break My Soul, Lost Con- Lost Frequencies, Con- Where Are You Now? That's a year old song. That's a year old song. And even I'm surprised BBC was playing it like it did earlier this year. That's a year old song. Drake, Massive, Marshmallow and Khalid, Numb. These are growing right now because there's not a lot of new songs that's, that radio will play right now. So they're having to go back and rehash songs and bring them back up. That's what they're doing. There's more into this. And then he talks about the songs that are not receiving significant CHR airplay. And this is where he says Spotify is where you see the vividly the industry dominance of Bad Bunny, but the streaming only stories here range from hip hop to acoustic pop to dance. Some songs will eventually make their way here, but the others are increasingly an indication that labels don't see an upside and every taking every phenomenal song to the radio. So here's some of the songs you're not going to hear on radio on a CHR station because it should. So Bad Bunny, Chicho Corleone, Ben Porto Bonito is one. Biz Rap featuring Quevedo, the Biz Rap Music Sessions. Steve Lacey's Bad Habit, which is hit, did hit a little bit on the BBC chart and the official chart over there, and BBC talked about it. Carol G. Provenza, which is a top 25 rhythmic hit. Bad Bunnies with a Bomba Estadio, Ojitos Lindos. Rosa Lynn with Snap. Shakir with Raul Alejandro Te Felicito. Ellie Duhay with the song Middle of the Night. It's a two year old song by an artist no longer signed to RCA. And it's a long-running fixture on today's top hits. Burner Boy's Last Last, which is a big Afrobeats type of song from a UK rapper that's doing very well. And it's a top 10 song right now in the UK on the official chart. And actually, it's charting worldwide. Benson Boone and the Stars, which did a little bit of run. Drake featured 21 Savage, Jimmy Cooks. 
James Hyatt versus featuring Miggy De La Rosa Ferrari. Sleepy Hollow featuring 347 Die Young. And Kendrick Lamar featuring Blast and Amanda Reifers Die Hard. So there's all of that for you. Radio always missing the spot. And they're always going to continue to be doing that. That's just the way they are. That's the show. We're going to keep it around 50 minutes tonight. I got everything I wanted to cover. And I hope you all appreciate where we got through all this right here. I'm not one of those big fan fan people of uh, DC and Marvel to where I can just talk all about that and all the other nuances that are going on about it. That's just not for me. But anyway, thank you for listening to the show. Catching in as you always do. I appreciate all of you listening in as you always do. And I hope you'll come back for another Broadcasters Podcast next week. Because remember, content is king. And the control of your content is in your hands. Thank you for listening to the Broadcasters Podcast. Find all the links to subscribe to the show by going to broadcasterspodcast.com. And don't forget to check out the King of Podcasts wrestling program, The Wrestling Is Real Podcast, exclusively at wrestlingisreal.com. 